evening, church. Before we dive in, I'm not sure if Gordon's here this evening as well. He was here this morning. He smashed it last week. If you were not here, he did a brilliant job. It was way more funny than I am uh, in like a month added up. Uh, did a great job. Uh, he taught on John chapter 17, which is based, not basically, which is the prayer Jesus prays where he prays for himself and then he prays for his disciples and then he prays for all of us who are ever going to believe it's it's pretty challenging to cover that much in in one uh, in one message uh, he just did a great job last week so i'm very thankful for that so last week we were talking about john chapter 17 uh for the last several weeks uh months as he pointed out we have been in a very succinct period of time maybe two hours maybe a little bit more but starting in chapter 13 of the book of John, where Jesus washes his disciples' feet, and then Judas leaves, and Jesus then starts teaching, and he, he's teaching throughout that about loving and, and that, but then he starts teaching more about the Holy Spirit and prayer, the expectation that God hears and will do what, what we ask because it's to his glory and and we've talked about that through this time uh, we talked about abiding abiding in, in jesus and, and staying connected to jesus well he's been t he's been talking and, and we've gone through 13 14 15 16 7, and then last week 17 that final prayer of his and now we're kind of transitioning into um the i want to call it the end but let's call it the new beginning uh, where, where we're going to be now approaching the, the cross uh, over the next few hours. We're going to get back into the story uh, of, the, of the, the crucifixion and ultimately resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Not to give it away, but I love giving it away. So uh, that, that's where we're going. Today we're going to cover Jesus' arrest in the Garden of Gethsemane. And so <clears throat> we're actually going to be focusing on a pretty serious theme tonight. And these first 14 verses are a pretty painful thing to, to talk about, this concept of, of betrayal, of being betrayed. And I want to be both sensitive and, and helpful as I talk about betrayal. And I talk about feeling betrayed. I know that, that many people in this room have, have experienced that, are still feeling scars, from betrayal, maybe even open wounds. Maybe we're not even that far along yet. Maybe the, the wounds are still fresh. Um, just, uh, betrayal is, is one of the most painful of human experiences. Betrayal is one of the most painful of human experiences because it begins with a person that you trusted, that you loved in one way or another, maybe, maybe loved very much. And so you trusted this person, you entrusted yourself to them, maybe you poured into them, poured into them, developed them, believed in them, gave them opportunities, other professionally to succeed, or maybe you're in a rom romantic relationship with them, but you trusted them. And all, not only did they not just let you down, which would have been disappointing, they turned on you with deliberate, selfish, hurtful behavior. With deliberate, selfish, hurtful behavior. And whatever they did or however they did it, it ended up shattering your trust and it broke your relationship, sometimes in extreme and severe ways. It's brutally painful to trust someone and then have them take that trust and, and just crush it by betraying you. As we talked about, as we talk about being betrayed, there is one thing that we can hold on to. And it's this idea that, that Jesus, he's been through that. He completely understands the brutal pain of being betrayed. Our God is completely sympathetic, empathetic, anything but pathetic when it comes to uh, his, his love for us, his understanding of us, and, and understanding that terrible kind of pain. He's experienced it. He's experienced very personally with Judas. Now, before we get into Judas the betrayer, I want to I remind you that Judas was actually Jesus' friend. And maybe as you look back at this story, you've, you've put some, 
some um, walls that aren't in the Bible around Jesus' heart. And this idea of, well, Jesus knew that Judas was going to betray him, so he, he protected himself by not actually liking Judas, but just keeping him around so that he could perform the Judas task. But, but he didn't actually love him or, or care about him. Um, that's, that's something that you're inserting in. When Jesus talks about him, he calls him friend. And, and it brings him into that, that helpful or that, that close relationship. Um, Judas is the only one, fun facts about Judas, he's the only one born in Judah, down in the south. Uh, actually, a little bit south of Jerusalem, it, Judas Iscariot, Iscariot meaning of Cariath, a southern Judah. And Ju Jesus chose him. Now, we know it's not that Judas was just around with him the whole time. We know from Acts, Acts chapter 1, uh, that there are people that are following Jesus everywhere from his baptism all the way through to his ascension. That there's, there's, there's some people that are there the whole time, part of the, that whole season. But Judas wasn't just part of that group that was around him for all those years. One day in Luke chapter 6, Jesus goes up onto the mountainside, he, or mountaintop, he prays all night, and then he comes down and he appoints, chooses 12 special ones to be sent ones, to be apostles. And one of those being Judas, to be especially close to him, uh, close. So he chooses him, and, and then Judas spends these years listening. He gets that inside scoop. Okay, that parable, that was interesting, Jesus, but we don't understand it. What? Okay, let me explain it to you. What? Let me, and then he's part of getting all that, that extra information. He is out there going out in pairs, announcing the kingdom of God, along with the other 12 at, at that point. Um, he, he is serving. He's bringing out food during the miracles of the feeding of 5,000. He's witnessing, at, at, at least witnessing, um, the, the miracles of Jesus. He's probably performing healings and delivering uh, deliverance ministry as he's been sent out to, to heal and to proclaim the kingdom and, and all that kind of stuff. He has been right at the heart of Jesus' close friends and being about his, his ministry. Don't imagine that Judas, uh, that Jesus didn't love Judas. That Judas was kind of like off to the side. Here, you go hold on to the money, and then and we're going to do the, the, big, the big kid stuff. No, that, that's not what was happening here. Uh, in fact, when it, when it comes to this night, Jesus does not wait to, for Judas to leave before he washes his disciples' feet. He takes the towel, he, he humbles himself, and he washes Judas' feet. And then later, Judas leaves. Um, this very night, according to Matthew chapter 6, Judas is going to show up with the soldiers, and Jesus is going to say, friend, why have you come? Friend, why have you come? Judas, for years, has been a close friend of Jesus. So, what happens in this moment? Well, this is what we read in John chapter 18. It says, after Jesus had said these things, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley where there was a garden. And he and his disciples went into it. Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas took a company of soldiers and some temple police from the chief priests and the Pharisees and came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. We're talking about deep, personal betrayal. He knew the place. He'd been there with Jesus before. This was Jesus' place where he met with his, his, his 12, with his special people. He, he knew the place. Personal betrayal from a friend. Jesus had poured into this friendship for years, and this is how... He's, re he's treated in return. Je Jesus had loved him and given him every opportunity, and yet this is how he's treated in return. Betrayal is completely unfair. Completely unfair, and it's painful, painful stuff. Sadly, it's also completely common. 
All the greats of the Bible experience betrayals, like Moses and, and David and, and Jesus and, and Paul. They, they all, ex and, and so many experience betrayal is so common, but the, com the commonness of betrayal doesn't mean it's not always painful every time. And I suppose the only cover we can take is that, that we are part of a huge uh, multi millennial family, millennium family that this great cloud of witnesses who understand those most brutally painful of moments. Betrayal. Betrayal. They, our, our, our family knows what that's like. Well, Jesus is betrayed by his close friend, and, and again, it's not just a betrayal. I mean, we have lots of different kinds of betrayal, but, but this betrayal means that Jesus is going to die. Like, this is like the big kind of betrayal, where he is now going to be crucified in a few hours because of this betrayal. It's, it's not like, okay, I, I just kind of... This was the big kind of betrayal. The big kind, where he betrays his friend, and then his friend is going to be killed. We go on to read this in, in this chapter, starting in verse 4. Then Jesus, knowing everything that was about to happen to him, went out and said to them... Who is it you're looking for? Jesus the Nazarene, they answered. I am. He. Jesus told him. I am he. Ego eimi. The word he is implied. It's just they put it in there. He, 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 the answer is ego eimi. I am. This is the the 14th and final time in the book of John where Jesus uses his God name, where, where he's referring to that moment in Exodus chapter 3 where Moses asks God, what is your name? What, what am I supposed to tell these people your name is? And God says, this is my name that I'm, I, want, I'm gonna be remember, I want to be remembered throughout the generations. This is my name. What is it? In English, it's I am. In Hebrew, it's Yahweh. In, in Greek, it's ego and me. So when they're like, who are you looking for? We're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. I am. Ego and me. I am. It's January. It's January. Are you here this evening, this January, looking for something? Are you looking for something? Are, who is it that you're looking for? Are, are you looking for hope? Are, are you looking for help? Are, are you looking for truth? Are, are, are you looking to find out if there really is a God out there? There is. His name is Jesus. And if you're one of those people who's looking and searching uh, Wednesday night, this week, we're starting Alpha. That is the safe place to come and, and ask questions about, about what you might be searching for, what you're looking for. Get, get your questions answered and at least talked about the ones that you're seeking. That's Wednesday night at 7.30. And here, though, when Jesus reveals his name as, as Yahweh, the God of the Bible, as, as Egoimi, as, as I am, as the great I am, what happens? He reveals his powerful name, and they all fall down. It says this. This is what it says. It says, um, who is it you're looking for? Jesus the Nazarene, they answered. I am, he, Jesus told them. Judas, who betrayed him, was also standing with them. When he told them, I am, he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Yes. <laughs> then he asked them again, who is it you're looking for? Jesus the Nazarene. They said, I told you, I am. He, Jesus replied, so if you're looking for me, let these men go. This isn't just the betrayal of Judas' friend, the one who's poured into him, believed in him, and, and all of that. This is a betrayal of the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible. And maybe some of you are sitting here like, well, man, that's, that's Judas. 
I would never betray the God of the Bible like Judas did. That's our propensity to look back and be like, oh, I would never do that. But, but sadly, Judas is not the only one to ever, ever betrayed Jesus. Uh, he's the one that betrayed him in that moment where he goes to the cross. We betray Jesus ourselves when we turn against him or stay silent when we're in conversations. Friends stand up for friends. Friends don't let their friends get slandered untruthfully, get spoken down about, and they definitely don't join in. Yeah, yeah, that, that is kind of true. By the pressure of the, the, the moment, um, you stand up for your friends, not standing up for the goodness of Jesus, the wonder of the salvation that we have in him, and instead just tolerating people's slander is a type of friendship betrayal. I would expect my friends to stand up for me. And I, I hope you would too. I would definitely not expect them to jump in on the let's talk bad about our friend bandwagon. Another, another example, Jesus has given us gifts. He's given us gifts to be used for him and for his kingdom, for his purposes in our generation. He's given us talents. He's given us abilities. He's given us opportunities. He's given us finances. He's given us influence. He's given us time. And he's handpicked the generation, the times, the, even the locations of where we're born and where we live. Uh, to, and he's given all of this to us for his, his kingdom and for his advancement and to, to worship him and to declare his greatness in our generation. And, and if we instead take our time and our resources and our gifts and, and instead of using them for Jesus in our generation, we just use them all for ourselves it's a form of betrayal. I gave you this for this kingdom. And you just used it all for yourself. Instead, you just live for yourself. I, I trusted you with all that. And you, you, didn't, you didn't use it for me. Or maybe when, when we know that we've been saved and rescued from the dom dominion of darkness, from the grip of darkness to be free from sin, huge cost paid, and then instead of saying no to sin because we have these feelings or feel these, these pressures on the inside, and instead of saying no to sin, we choose to not do what's right. And we betray the one who entrusted us with salvation and grace. Judas here is betraying his friend and God. And what happens? Well, he said, I, I told you I am... He, Jesus replied, so if you're looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the words he had said, I have not lost one of those you have given me. In great contrast to Judas, the bad friend, Jesus protects his own. He steps forward. Who are you looking for? He steps forward. He makes sure that he defines, who are you looking for? You're looking for me. Let, let these people go. The real friends protect they're, they're friends. They care for them, even sacrificially, making sure that they're going to be all right, even when things are crashing down for them. Verse 10, Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Now, I think it's, it's funny here that um, John leaves out the little detail. He's, he's good with details. He cut off not just his ear, he cut off his right ear, but he leaves off the detail of, oh yeah, and Jesus put it back on again. Like you would think, you would think that that, uh, if we're talking about details, that might make the book. I mean, yeah, Jesus picked it up, he put it on upside down, he laughed a little bit, and then he turned around and stick it back on. Uh, you, you would think, even just six words, it's, it's like, and Jesus stuck it back on. Like, you, but he leaves out that detail. Now, knowing John, though, is to keep us focused. It's to keep us focused. Because his message, it, uh, the idea of putting the ear back on might, might have been a distracting detail there for John. Because the focus is on the slave. It's not on the ear being healed, but on the name of the guy who was healed. I think John knows this guy. I, I think we find out in verse 15 that John is an acquaintance of the high priest. This is the high priest's slave. I think that John might, might have known this guy. Um, but he also is able to say, look, this is a true story. It happened to Malchus. Go ask him. Like, this, is, this happened. You, you heard of one year, two year Malchus? I don't know. I don't know what his nickname was, but uh, go verify two year, one year, two year. I don't know. Uh, go I. Uh, stop talking. Anyways, 
So um, that truthful ver uh, 11. At that time, Jesus said to Peter, sheath your sword. Am I not to drink the cup the Father has given me? And here we go. Acceptance. Acceptance. Jesus accepts the cup, the call, the very unpleasant and painful path ahead. He accepts the betrayal. It isn't, he is not going to fight for a different future. He's going to willingly accept the pain because he knows that it's God's path and plan for him. If you have ever, or if you ever do feel the sting of betrayal, sometimes the pain can be crippling. Sometimes it can be absolutely crippling and you can find yourself completely stuck in the pain of the betrayal. Completely uh, thrown off for a long season of time, for, for months. Some people are thrown off for years by the pain of betrayal. But I want to say there is a way forward for everyone who has felt betrayed, even most severely betrayed. There is a way forward to healing in that a, a way forward from moving from the crippling and life impacting pain to, to being healed from that in fact the way forward has two two different aspects to the path because two different things are needed uh, when and uh, to be dealt with when a betrayal takes place for healing the first thing you have to understand about betrayal and it's not in it's not immediately obvious unless you step back and look at it. And this is where a lot of people, they don't see it, and so they don't take this path, or they don't understand that this is the path to healing from it. But, but the first thing you understand is that the betrayal and the broken trust at the heart of betrayal is that betrayal always includes grief. It's not the first thing you think of, but there's always grief connected to betrayal. Something is lost. Something is broken when a betrayal takes place. Something dies on the inside. Trust dies. A relationship dies. Closeness dies. And maybe it'll come back to life someday, depending on what the whole story and circumstances. But there is an immediate, major relational change and loss that takes place, with the result being grief. Grief. So working through the pain of betrayal includes working through the steps of grief, the same steps as if you'd, a close friend had moved away or somebody that you loved uh, passes away. Grieving the loss of a relationship that you thought you had is what takes place when you're looking at betrayal. Just as a quick reminder, the steps of grief are, number one, denial. You, you, maybe, maybe this happens really quickly. I, I can't believe my... They would do this to me, or maybe you heard of it uh, secondhand. Somebody tells you, oh, this, your, your, your best friend did this, and you're like, no, they wouldn't do that, and, and, and sometimes they haven't, for sure, but, then there, but there is that denial. Uh, sometimes you can work through that one really quickly, and you get to the next step, which is anger. Anger, with betrayal, intense anger. You, you trusted them. You love them. This is so messed up. And you're like, I, I rage quit on you or, or whatever. They get, I, I'm raging about this. And, and that anger can last for, for a long time because there's so much unfair, injustice in it. But you can't get stuck here. Th that's part of the process, but you, you can't get stuck here. You need to keep moving. The next step is depression. When the anger subsides, the pain remains, the, the fire dies down, but there's, a, there's still a hole there, a relationship hole. Somebody that you trusted and loved, and they're, they're not in that place in your life anymore. And then there's bargaining is the next grief step. You know, God, you allowed this to happen. You owe me. You owe me a better friend. You owe me a better relationship. And five, acceptance. Acceptance. And that's where we see Jesus here. Now, this, this betrayal didn't surprise Jesus. It, it may have surprised other people, but Jesus has been talking about this. He knew it was going to be happening. Uh, so that takes a huge amount of shock away from the betrayal. Most betrayals you don't see coming. But Jesus knew it was going to come. He, he was prepared for it, and so he can start in that acceptance place. Am I not to drink the cup the Father has given me? You don't see it in this gospel, but Jesus this evening has been praying uh, with intensity and sweat like drops of blood 
just in that, in that intensity, but now he's at a place of acceptance of this path before him. Just as a reminder, when we talked in the Joseph series, we talked a lot more about grief and, and grieving and, and walking through these steps. They take time, I said, during that season, and you need to keep going. I talked about how Joseph's dad, Jacob, didn't go through this process well, and he got stuck, and he got stuck for like 20 years. And that not progressing through the grief steps brought a real toxicity to his heart that impacted his whole family for, for decades. It, it, it's, you're you're going to go through these steps at one level or another, depending on the severity of it all, but you've got to keep working. If you want to know more about grief specifically, you can, you can pull up that, that message from the Joseph series about Jacob and grief there. If you're experiencing betrayal, it's, it's just helpful to understand that you're experiencing grief. That's one of the things you're experiencing. Now, some wrong responses to betrayal include things like closing yourself off from future relationships. That person hurt me, so I'm not going to do that relationship thing again. I'm not going to trust people again. Making decisions to not trust people or, or to position your life so you don't need to trust people. Just trying to protect yourself from future pain. It makes sense, but that's not a healthy response to betrayal. Instead, the right response is working through our grief, working through and coming out on the other side with healing and healthy and able to trust people again. I'm not saying you have to trust that person again. That's not the goal, to trust them again. But it is to be able to trust people again. What else do we read here? Well, in verse 12, it says, Then the company of soldiers, the commander, and the Jewish temple police arrested Jesus and tied him up. First they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was, the high, who was high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was advantageous that one man should die for the people. Again, just unfair betrayal. So entirely, terribly unfair, undeserved, totally undeserved. This story has the most innocent person betrayed with the result that he's arrested by armed soldiers, he is tied up, and he is brought on trial, having done nothing wrong to people who hate him and who are jealous of him and already know how they're going to convict him before he's shown up. They've known for a long time how they're going to convict him. It's completely unfair. This is what makes betrayal so brutal. You didn't deserve to be treated that way. You didn't deserve to be betrayed. You didn't deserve it. Now, a master manipulator might try and make you feel like you deserved it. But the truth is, nobody deserves that. Nobody. I said before, there are two different things. That, that need to take place when healing from betrayal. The first is working through stages of grief. The second is working through the process of forgiving. Forgiving. You're not going to be able to completely heal from any betrayal until you're able to forgive the one who's betrayed you. A few notes on forgiveness. Number one, forgiveness is not about them or what they did at all. It's about you. And your walk with God. You can save a lot of frustration if you understand that forgiving them isn't about what they did. It isn't about them. It, it's about you and responding to God. You, you, you can just save yourself a lot of anguish if you, if you grab that. Second thing about forgiveness. Forgiveness is not an automatic response. It is an intentional obedience choice. It is not natural to forgive someone who rips your heart up. But you do have a choice whether you're going to forgive them or not. We don't forgive because it's easy and natural. We forgive because we've been commanded to do that by the one who knows that it's needed for our healing. Friends, Jesus really does know you and love you and he knows what's best for you and he doesn't want you to live with poison in your heart. He doesn't want you to live with that poison in your heart and, and that, that wound. Oh, but he wants to bring healing to those wounds and he knows the only way for that to happen is for you to do what you don't want to do and forgive everyone who has sinned against you. 
everyone who's betrayed you. And if you're a Christian, the example being, the, like you have been forgiven of everything. Third note about forgiveness. Forgiveness is not being fine with what happened. It's surrendering the person and the pain to Jesus. You're not saying it's okay. What I, what I mean is when we're betrayed, we want them to feel pain. We want them to, we want them to, to be paid back. We want them to suffer. We want them to, to hurt. We're angry. We're angry and, and we're hurt and everything. But what we need to do is go to Jesus and hand him our horrible situation and ask him to sort it all out. He promises to be the one who, ven who brings vengeance, who avenges. He promises to discipline. You know, if you're like, that person's a Christian, what's God going to do to them? He disciplines people he loves. What I do is I close my eyes and picture Jesus. Usually I find myself, when it comes to pain, picturing the very bottom of the cross. And, and it, just like the very bottom, maybe the feet of Jesus, just the very bottom, it seems to be the thing. And, and, and in my pain moments, it's like I'm not really able to really picture him, it, it, just that, that bit. And I, and I take the pain, and it, th this is my, what I do, I, it's like I just take this pain, I picture this pain, and I, I place it at Jesus' feet, saying, Jesus, I need you to take my pain. I have very real, I need you to take my pain. I give it to you, and I'm not going to hold on to it any longer. I need to leave this here. It's ripping me up. It's tearing me up. I need to give this to you. If it's a person in the case of betrayal, I'm going to pray, Jesus, this person betrayed me. They, they, they hurt me. They hurt me. You know all about the pain of betrayal. You know what that's like. I am placing this person and their life and their future in, in, in your hands. Uh, I, I am not going to treat them as they deserve to be treated. I am going to let them and their future and their life and their situation go. You see, you know, you can deal with it if there's anything that needs to be dealt with. I, I trust you to deal with it, even if I can see something happen or not. I trust you with this. I am going to let this go, and I'm going to leave this here at your feet. You, you take this and, and do something about it, but I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it here. You do what's right. And then also, I say, and I choose to forgive them for what they've done to me. I choose to forgive them for what they've done to me. It's terrible, Jesus. It's painful. It's horrible. It's, it's evil. But I choose to forgive give them. And I am, I'm going to release this, this desire of mine to see them suffer. I choose to forgive them and, and hand them over to you. And then finally, I, after doing that, I say, now, Jesus, come and, and heal my hurting heart. Jesus, come and heal my hurting heart. In just a few hours, Jesus is going to say these most powerful words from everyone that was connected to his crucifixion. He's going to say, Father... Forgive them. He's going to say, Father, forgive them. Betrayal is brutal. The wounds are, are real. And they're, they're deep. The process of moving towards healing has to do with grief, going through the stages of grief and, and forgiving and asking Jesus to come and heal your wounded heart. I would just be thankful that, that God, the, the Jesus who receives that pain and that, that person that you're handing to them, he knows all about betrayal. He gets it. We can trust him with that. And he's given us the Holy Spirit to help us and bring healing to our hearts in, in those painful days, restoring our souls and restoring our spirits got three challenges connected to this. If you're feeling the pain of a recent betrayal, identify where you're at in the grief process, in the forgiveness process. I'm in the anger stage. Like, depending on when it is, yeah. That's, you're going to be in it at one point or another. What stage are you in, just so you can know where you're at in that process. And then I ask you to forgive that person, to choose to forgive them again. 
Maybe you, you, when, I, when, I, when I've forgiven someone and I'm walking down the street and they come back into my heart and it stings and I'm like, I choose again to forgive them. And thirdly, invite in your prayers the Holy Spirit to bring healing to your heart.